thank you again so much for having me. The uh, structure of the talk so that you can um, get, get a sense of what's happening, when it will, when it will be done. Uh, so I'll spend about 10 minutes now just on some purely Buddhist content. Might be familiar to a lot of you, but I think there are folks here, some folks are, many folks are coming from a Shinshu background, a Pure Land background. Some folks maybe not. Uh, so, so there's a little bit of uh, kind of doctrinal Buddhist content at the very beginning. Then there's a long middle section, about 40 minutes, where I'll, I'll do the philosophical content, talking about uh, one Japanese philosopher in particular and her idea of uh, the teacher-student relationship in Zen versus the teacher-student relationship in Pure Land. And then at the end, the final 10 minutes uh, or so, uh, I'll get into a practical question, which is really a question that I have for all of you about uh, what an ideal teacher-student relationship should look like in the Buddhist context. Okay, uh, for the first part of it, I'm gonna try sharing my screen. The first part of it has some images. The middle part, not so much, but the first part, I can show you some images, hopefully. Yeah, so hopefully now I'm in a small box in the corner of your screen and you can see some text uh, on the screen. I can't see my own text. So the question I'm starting with uh, is who was Honen to Shinran? Shinran, of course, is the founder of Jodo Shinshu, as many of you know already. Uh, Honen was his teacher or his master. And Shinran very famously, although we now recognize him as a founder and a patriarch, Shinran himself denied being a founder, denied being a patriarch. He said, I have no interest in being a founder. I have no interest in being a patriarch to anybody. I, Shinran, am a Honen student. And that's it. That's all I am. I'm a disciple of uh, Honen. So who was Honen to Shinran? On the one hand, we're seeing here from this text that will be familiar to many of you, the Tanisho, we are uh, seeing or hearing Shinran say that Honen is the master on whom he, Shinran, has staked everything. So he says, as for me, Shinran, I can only accept what my venerable master Honen said, just say the Nembutsu and be saved by Amida. I personally do not know whether reciting the Nembutsu will be the seed of my birth in the Pure Land or whether it will create the karma which will cause me to fall into hell. But even if I discover that I have been deceived by Honen Shonin, and that because I have said the Nembutsu, I will fall into hell, I will have no regrets. So Honen is the person, it's described here as the person who has given Shinran the teaching that is the sum total of his religious life. Just say the Nembutsu and be saved by Amida, that's it. Uh, he's also saying um, that he's, he's staking everything on Honen even though he can't know what the outcome is going to be. So he's taking the risk of staking everything on the teaching that has been given to him by, by his master uh, without knowing what the future holds. So there's a risk here. So that's one way of thinking about who Honen is to Shinran, the, the teacher on whom he is taking this big gamble of his life. Elsewhere, Shinran describes Honen in quite a different way. So, uh, whereas in the Tanisho we get a kind of very uh, human Shinran, it's very interesting to philosophers, and in the Kyogyo Shinsho we get the kind of textual genius Shinran, which is very interesting to scholars of Buddhist doctrine. In the hymns, we get a very emotional kind of Shinran, a Shinran who is expressing a very nuanced, deep set of feelings around uh, the question of salvation. In the hymns, uh, Shinran tells us uh, that Hunan uh, actually was a miraculous person. So we're seeing him say here, when Honan was alive, he emanated a golden light 
which the chancellor, an ordained layman, the chancellor here is a Conan's most important, most powerful lay supporter. I'm sorry, there's something going on in the alley outside. It's very loud, I apologize. But, which the chancellor and ordained layman saw before him. So Shinran actually is saying here, uh, not, not just me, Shinran, but this very powerful, important uh, aristocrat saw Conan emanating a golden light. We know from Buddhist tradition, if you're emanating a golden light, you figured something out. You, there's something very special about you. You're not an ordinary person. You must be some kind of Buddha or Bodhisattva. Uh, elsewhere in his hymns on the Pure Land Masters, he writes of his own teacher, Honen, born on isolated islands, scattered like millet in the sea. That's Japan. Japan is the isolated islands that are kind of an afterthought at the edge of the, the massive middle kingdom of China. So this is a typical medieval Japanese understanding of Japan as a really like the end, the end of the universe, the middle of nowhere. So born in the middle of nowhere, he spread the teaching of Nembutsu. In order to guide sentient beings, he came into this world many times. So here Shinran is saying, uh, Honen has been here before. He's come into the world again and again to try to spread the teaching of Nembutsu. He didn't discover it in this lifetime. He's been coming. He's been doing this teaching. So again, this is an implication. Conan's not an ordinary person. Who is he? Well, sometimes Shinran says that Honen is actually Amida Tathagata. Honen, his teacher, is the Buddha who is going to save him. So Amida Tathagata, manifesting form in this world, appeared as our teacher Honen. The conditions for teaching having run their course, he returned to the Pure Land. So Honen here didn't achieve birth in the Pure Land in, in his own life. He came from the Pure Land. He had been in the Pure Land. He came back to the world to spread the teachings of Nembutsu and then went back to the Pure Land. So did Honen know he was going to the Pure Land when he died? For sure, because he, he was just going back to his own home. He's not uh, only Honen. He's a manifestation of the Tathagata. And then elsewhere he says, uh, that Honen is uh, the Bodhisattva Dai Seishi. Uh, let us respond with deep gratitude for the great benevolence of Bodhisattva Dai Seishi, the original state of Master Honen. So who is Honen really? He's really Amida Tathagata. He's really this Bodhisattva. So who is this Bodhisattva? This Bodhisattva, uh, some of you know already. This Bodhisattva Daiseishi is one of the two bodhisattvas who are uh, pictured as accompanying Amida. Uh, if we look at uh, each of these images, you see the, the big Amida Tathagata in the center and the two smaller bodhisattvas flanking him on either side. The, bodhisattva, uh, the, bodhi the two bodhisattvas who accompany Amida are the bodhisattva of compassion, uh, Kanmon or Avalokiteshvara, and the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, Daiseishi or Mahastama Prapta. I'm going to zoom in on the uh, standing Amida to show you the Bodhisattvas more closely. Uh, in the foreground, so on the uh, right, on our right, on Amida Buddha's left, is the Bodhisattva of Compassion carrying this lotus seat. So Kanon Avalokiteshvara here is uh, in the front. Uh, this is an image of the, the Amida and the two Bodhisattvas approaching the deathbed of the Pure Land Believer. And Kanmon Bodhisattva is right in front with this lotus seat and the Believer is going to climb onto the lotus seat and Kanmon, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, is going to carry the Believer to the Pure Land. So Kanmon has a very active role to play. Poor Daiseishi, Mahatama Rata, is sort of in the back, the hands in the prayer gesture. This is, um, this image is evocative of the relative importance that these two bodhisattvas have had in the Buddhist imagination. Kanon Bodhisattva is very important, the Bodhisattva compassion, very important in the Pure Land imagination and also very important outside of the Pure Land imagination. Uh, across the Buddhist world, people have been 
very drawn to the bodhisattva of compassion. They're very interested in generating a strong karmic relationship with the bodhisattva of compassion. And no wonder, because the bodhisattva of compassion is the embodiment of the Tathagata's compassion, the embodiment of the Buddha's compassion. So if you need something, you just ask the Bodhisattva of Compassion. The Bodhisattva of Compassion has this infinite number of gifts. Sometimes the Bodhisattva of Compassion appears as a, a man with a male embodiment and sometimes as a woman with a female embodiment. So you can ask him or ask her for something. She has this infinite number of gifts that she's ready to give. She's waiting all the time, listening for suffering, ready to reach out to alleviate suffering. You, there's something very human, I think, about the Buddhist uh, practitioners in uh, pre-modern Buddhist tradition being very interested in the Bodhisattva of compassion and kind of, you can feel them saying, okay, Bodhisattva of wisdom, also very important. Uh, we can wait though. Right now, the urgent need is for compassion. We're suffering a lot. So let's focus on the Bodhisattva of compassion. Maybe later, we'll ask the Bodhisattva of wisdom for something. So come on, we see all the time in so many different forms, so many stories uh, about Kanon that give that Bodhisattva uh, a kind of very rich image in our minds. But Mahasthama Prapta, we don't hear so much about. So it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting then that that for Honen, uh, uh, excuse me, for Shinran, Honen was the manifestation of Daiseishi and not Kanon, right? the manifestation of wisdom and not the manifestation of, of compassion. I think there's a reason for this. Uh, here's Daiseishi on his own, Mahasthama Prapta on his own. One of the few places where we see Mahasthama Prapta discussed without uh, Kanon Avalokiteshvara on the scene is in a text called the Shurangama Sutra. The Shurangama Sutra is an important sutra in the Chinese Zen tradition. Uh, it's one of the places where the doctrine of Buddha nature gets articulated most clearly. This idea that all of us have a Buddha potential inside of ourselves. That's in the Shurangama Sutra. But there's also a chapter in the Shurangama about Mahasthama Prapta. And in the Shurangama, we are told that Mahasthama Prapta, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, the embodiment of Buddhist wisdom, many, many countless thousands of years ago, long before this world existed, learned about Amida Buddha from another Buddha and learned about the practice of Nembutsu and did the practice of Nembutsu. And it is by doing the practice of Nembutsu, according to the Sutra, that the Bodhisattva wisdom became awakened. So how did the Bodhisattva wisdom become so wise? So Bodhisattva wisdom became wise by doing Nambutsu practice by contemplating the features of Amida Tathagata. So Shinran would know that. Shinran then would know that uh, Daiseishi Bodhisattva, Mahasthama Prapta Bodhisattva was a practitioner of Nambutsu long before this world came into existence. Mahasthama Prapta was practicing Nambutsu. So Honen's original form, he's saying, was, that, was as this great practitioner of Nambutsu. I'm just going to check in on the chat. Oops. OK, so if any, if there are any questions are arising, any comments, please uh, feel free to pop them into the chat. The fact, that Honen, uh, the fact that Honen was for Shinran, the embodiment of the Bodhisattva of wisdom and the embodiment of Amida Tathagata, a miraculous person, presents us with a puzzle. And the puzzle is this. Shinran says in Tanisho 
even if I discover that I have been deceived by Hona and Shonin, and that because I have said the Nembutsu, I will fall into hell, I will have no regrets. And that is a very powerful uh, statement of his willingness to wager everything on Honen. If he knew that Honen was the instantiation in this world of the Bodhisattva of wisdom and Amida Tathagata, then how could he ever have thought that Honen might be deceiving him? The Bodhisattva of wisdom, by definition, uh, transmits wisdom and, and not lies. Right? So Amida Tathagata doesn't come into this world to, to trick you. The Bodhisattva of wisdom doesn't come into this world to trick you. The suggestion that he might have been deceived by Honen makes sense if Honen was ordinary and does not seem to make sense if he, if he thought that Honen was not a person but a miraculous appearance in the world of these um, Buddhas, this Buddha and this Bodhisattva. So in what sense is Shinran thinking that he's taking a risk? That's the question that this philosopher is going to pose to us. Yeah, I really like that song, huh? Oh. That's a, I'm just, I'm going to take a, a break to look at the chat and see the question. Uh, so the, the question in the chat was, what was uh, Seishi Bodhisattva's motivation to practice the Nembutsu before this Saha world came into existence? And the answer to that is that he was in his own Saha world. So before this Saha world, there was another world of suffering and a world of suffering before that and a world of suffering before that. Well, that's like the whole thing. She hasn't gotten to this end, but she's going to talk about this philosopher, the Japanese philosopher. I think, and I'm going to interrupt myself for a second and say, I think someone's mic is on. Yeah, so, also. yeah, so I'm just going to ask uh, if everyone could, could just mute their microphone, if you don't mind. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so now I am, I'm going to get into that philosopher. So here's the philosopher. Uh, her name is Keta Masako. She's uh, the um, most recent holder of this chair in Kyoto School of Philosophy at Kyoto University. There are two things that are very interesting uh, about Keta, uh, two things that make her quite unusual in the history of modern Japanese philosophy. And the first is that she's a woman. She's the first woman to hold that chair, the first woman to be recognized as a Kyoto School philosopher. Uh, and the second thing that's interesting about her is that uh, most Kyoto School philosophers, most Japanese, philosophers of religion are very interested in Zen. Zen's very interesting. No wonder they're interested in it. But Keta is very interested in Pure Land. We can see here uh, on the, uh, next to her photo, you see the cover of uh, the book that kind of won her her position uh, in the Kyoto School uh, lineage. Uh, and that's a book about Pure Land thought. So she's unusual, it's unusual, she's a woman, it's unusual that she's primarily thinking and writing about Pure Land. And what is interesting about the way that she deals with Pure Land Buddhism as a philosopher is that unlike most philosophers who take up Pure Land Buddhism and try to focus only on doctrine, Keta is actually very interested in the things that make Pure Land unique. Uh, she's very interested in narrative as an element of Pure Land thinking. And she's very interested in emotion as an element of Pure Land thinking. So a lot of writers on Japanese Buddhism, we get the impression from them that Pure Land would be interesting if only you took away all the stories and took away all the emotion, then you'd have something serious. So like Keta is trying to argue uh, no, actually the stories are where the serious thinking is taking place. 
the emotions are where the serious thinking is taking place. So it's not just that she's interested in pure land, she's interested in the parts of pure land that other philosophers have typically not been interested in. Uh, and so that's why she's very interested in the hymns. She's interested in the wasan, where Shinran is talking about his teacher, Honen, in this very uh, emotional way. This, this way that's revealing of a kind of great love for uh, Honen. If she wasn't looking at the hymns, the puzzle of that passage in the Tani show would not have arisen for her. But so she's interested in trying to figure out, okay, uh, what does Shinran mean when he says that Honen is the embodiment of the Bodhisattva wisdom? What does Shinran mean when he says that Honen is the embodiment of Amida Tathagata? And how do we make that line up with the claim that, um, that uh, there's a risk that Shinran is taking when he chooses Honen and chooses Nembutsu? Her, her, she doesn't talk about, I'm just looking at the chat. So there's a question in the chat, what's her religious background or personal affiliation? I don't know. Uh, and I think that is, um, I think that is deliberate. She's, uh, she's not writing from the perspective of a person of faith. She's really writing in a, I think you'll see, she's writing in quite a, a philosophical way. Uh, her work is in Japanese. I'm, working with two good colleagues on a translation of this book, Philosophy of Religious Experience, right now. So we hope that it will be available in English soon. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how we do that. Okay, so Keta, let's see how we do. Yeah. Keta tells us that the teacher-student relationship is fundamental to all kinds of books. There is no Buddhism without a teacher-student relationship. And we can think of that, we can go back to the, the historical Buddha. Uh, we can recall that um, the historical Buddha became the historical Buddha, not when he became awakened under the Bodhi tree, because according to tradition, many others had done that already before he came along in this world. Uh, he became the historical Buddha when he got up from the Bodhi tree and decided to remain in the world to try to teach others. So the teacher-student relationship defines the existence of Buddhas as meaningful to Buddhist tradition. Uh, and structures all of Buddhist practice, really. Keta also says, though, that the teacher-student relationship, although it's found pervasively across Buddhism, there is no Buddhist tradition without that kind of relationship, takes on a very distinctive form in Zen and takes on a very distinctive form in Japanese Pure Land. So I'm gonna start by telling you what she says is distinctive about the teacher-student relationship in Zen, and then I'll try to explain why she thinks the Pure Land version of that relationship is uh, so different. So what is distinctive about the teacher-student relationship in Zen, uh, according to Keta Masako, I think I can stop sharing my screen for the moment. Let me try to do that. Uh, what is distinctive about the teacher-student relationship in Zen is that it culminates with the destruction of the teacher-student relationship. So the teacher-student relationship in Zen acquires maturity, comes to fruition when the student overcomes the teacher. The job of the student is to overcome the teacher. Uh, we get a sense of this in the famous Zen phrase, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. If you meet a patriarch, kill that patriarch. That Killing is a way of saying, overcome that master, overcome that teacher. The Korean Zen teacher, uh, Sung San, used to tell his students, there are three things you have to kill 
in this life. First, you must kill the Buddha. Second, you must kill your parents. Third, you must kill me, Sung San. So this is the teacher telling his students, you have to kill me. First you rely on, like, first you rely on your parents, well, stop relying on your parents. Then you rely on the Buddha, well, stop relying on the Buddha. Finally, you rely on your teacher, but you must stop relying on me as well. Your training isn't done until you're not relying on anything. This Keta says, uh, the idea that you bring the teacher-student relationship to maturity by overcoming the teacher, this she says is totally consistent with the Zen idea of a separate transmission. So in Zen, uh, Zen says of itself, Zen is a separate transmission outside the scriptures, not reliant on words and phrases. And Keta says, you could make a mistake there. It would be easy to make a mistake and to think, oh, that means uh, as a student, I don't rely on the sutras. Uh, I don't rely on the long tradition of writings. I only rely on the teacher who's in front of me to transmit Buddha mind to me. Keta says that's wrong. Uh, that actually, if you're relying on the teacher who's in front of you, you'll never realize your Buddha mind because your Buddha mind is not something the teacher has. You have it already. So you realize it when you overcome the teacher. And this is consistent with an understanding of a deep understanding of Zen as a self power school. Uh, what you are actually trying to discover is a kind of independence from the tradition, uh, independence from the teacher. So how is the teacher overcome? The teacher is overcome uh, in a confrontation that will bring about what is called a limit situation. This is a philosophical term she's taking from the German philosopher Karl Jaspers. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my screen up one last time, not for very long, uh, but just to uh, cover this one point as clearly as I can. So you should now see on the screen a little picture of a hermit crab uh, uh, underneath uh, the name of the philosopher whose idea it is, Karl Jaspers. In German, it's a Grenzsituation, uh, and the English for that is limit situation. So Kepe is using this, this um, expression of limit situation to try to describe what the Zen teacher is there for in the relationship with the student. Uh, so then we need to ask, okay, what is a limit situation? Well, Jasper says that most of us live most of the time uh, as though the world that we know, the reality that we know is totally secure and uh, absolute. It, it is what it is. It doesn't really change. Um, in that way, uh, our world, he says, for us is like a shell. Um, so we're like a hermit crab inside of a shell. <clears throat> and the shell is very secure. Uh, the shell is very rigid. Uh, and for that reason, the shell feels both safe and uh, permanent. And within that shell, uh, our, our potential is sort of restricted. There's only so big that we can get inside the world of the shell. But Jasper says, he's very Buddhist in his way, Jasper says, inevitably events will occur in each of our lives that um, shatter that shell that we live in by exposing the world as actually not absolute, as exposing the world as changing all the time. Um, so this world that we hope is safe and secure uh, is actually insecure uh, and impermanent. Jaspers says that we will 
come to this point in moments of intense suffering, in moments of very grave illness. And even if somehow we make it a long time without um, very much suffering or very much illness, inevitably uh, we will um, encounter the um, shattering of the shell in death. Uh, perhaps the death of someone whom we love very much. And perhaps in thinking seriously, or really, about our own death. It's death, more than anything else, Jasper says, that exposes the world as impermanent, exposes the, the shell as uh, kind of vulnerable. So this moment, when the world that you took to be safe and secure is shattered, that Jasper calls a limit situation. When you're really suffering, you're in a limit situation. When you're really ill, you might find yourself in a limit situation. When you're uh, facing death, you find yourself in a limit situation. Uh, Jaspers could not have anticipated this, but uh, actually my own inclination is to say that for the last several months, uh, all of us here in the United States have been uh, approaching a limit situation as the kind of structures of our world uh, have changed so much have, that um, how the uh, coronavirus has uh, made everything seem so uh, untenable in a certain way. So Jaspers also says that the majority of us when encountering a limit situation because a limit situation is uh, something that makes us vulnerable and uh, is painful, uh, most of us will uh, close our eyes and pretend that it's not happening. Uh, we will say, this is only temporary, we'll go back to normal. Uh, this, uh, this is um, uh, bearable for now, but we're gonna go back to normal. So that, he says, is a very normal human response to the limit situation, but also a kind of tragic response to the limit situation. Uh, because when we pretend that the limit situation is not happening, uh, not only do we suffer more, um, but we miss the opportunity inherent in the limit situation, which is, of course, to grow. If your shell is shattered, if your world is shattered, uh, without discounting the pain of that, Jasper says, that is an opportunity for you to grow and deepen, to expand. And he's especially thinking what grows, what expands is self-understanding, self-knowledge, understanding of the world. So Jaspers also tells us, if you were to plunge forward into the limit situation, uh, if you were to take that gamble, then you would experience a deep and expansive transformation in your understanding. And we see people trying to do that now too, I think. On the one hand, we see, I'll, I shouldn't say, I'll speak from my own situation, which is here in Ohio. Um, uh, Many people now really, really want to go back to normal. So they really want to go to restaurants. They want to go to the beach. They want to go to the mall. And they will say, oh, I, just, I just want to get back to normal. There is a smaller number of people, but not such a small number now. There's a smaller number of people who are saying, what if this is actually a moment when we could look back and say, oh, the normal that we had was not so good. Actually, a lot of people uh, were really harmed by the normal that we had. What if, what if in this limit situation, we tried to plunge forward and do something new to organize our world differently? How could we make things not just go back to the way they were, which were not so good, but instead build something better out of the very precarious situation we're in right now. So Jaspers is not such a political guy. He's not so interested in 
kind of social transformation. But he does think that each one of us will have a choice every time we're in a limit situation to either retreat, to try to put the shell back together, or to move forward, uh, to take a risk uh, and grow in understanding. Keta's suggestion, Keta's suggestion is that the role of the teacher in Zen is to bring the student into a limit situation. Uh, so if you're familiar with Zen at all, you might be familiar with koan practice. Uh, in here, the um, Zen teacher Mumon is describing the experience of koan practice. So the student has been given a question that is uh, difficult to answer. And that question serves as a barrier. And Mumon is saying, uh, you have come to this barrier and you can either go back which means leave the monastery, stop doing Zen practice, fail, just go back to ordinary life. Or you can try to push forward. You can, uh, you can endure the pain of the barrier, which just feels like drinking a hot iron ball that you can neither swallow nor spit out. Well, if you can break through that barrier, uh, then your understanding will undergo this very profound, expansive transformation. You'll enter into a new kind of world. Mumon is describing the question of the koan, but Keta says actually the teacher is the embodiment of the koan. The teacher has to be the barrier. So the student comes to the teacher uh, and tries to answer the question and the teacher rejects the answer. It's not good enough. And that is the, the essential confrontation between student and teacher. And that process will continue until either the student gives up and leaves the monastery, leave, leaves practice, or Keta says, until the student can overcome the teacher, can surpass the teacher uh, in terms of understanding. And when the student surpasses the teacher in terms of understanding, then it will be as though the teacher disappears. And then there's only the student. He's no longer a student. Uh, this is the self-destruction of the teacher-student relationship. It makes me think about a story that a friend of mine told me uh, once about um, his own Zen practice. He he is now a, a monastic in Japan, but at the time he was doing koan practice in um, Montreal. Uh, and so he was doing this uh, kind of this practice, koan practice of uh, dialogue with the teacher, where he would, he was, had been given the koan and he would go into the teacher's uh, room to try to give his answer. And when he gave a bad answer, the teacher would ring a bell and that my friend would know, oh, that means I didn't, I didn't do it today. I didn't succeed today. Uh, so he had to leave the room. And he said, I went in, you know, I went in one day, I talked for a little while, then I got the bell. And I went in the next day and I talked for a little while and I got the bell. And I went in the next day and I talked a little less than before and I got the bell. And he said, near the end of the practice, all he had to do was just show up at the door. He would just put his face in, in through the door and the teacher would look at him and he would ring the bell. <laughs> he didn't even get a chance to put one foot inside. Just ring the bell. This is an example of generating a very intense conflict between the teacher and the student, uh, which because it was successful, drove the student, my friend in this case, uh, into the place of the limit situation where his, his whole sense of what was secure was totally shattered. And that was the moment when it became possible for him to plunge forward, to expand in terms of his self-understanding. So because the teacher here is like a wall that the student needs to overcome in confrontation, Keta says it's actually very important that the teacher be great because you, only will get the results that you're looking for 
if the teacher is really strong. It's like a, a contest. So you need a very powerful competitor. You need a very powerful opponent or else you won't develop your strength. Mm. Uh, I'm seeing a very interesting question, uh, observation in the chat, and I hope we can get back to it at the end. Uh, that means that the student needs to take time discerning whether or not the teacher uh, is um, someone that they are going to be able to recognize as a teacher. And the teacher equally needs to spend some time thinking about whether the student is someone they can recognize as a student. And she says, that's why there's the practice in Zen of the student having to wait at the gate for a long time before the teacher will allow them into the training hall. During that time, she says, both the teacher and the student are trying to figure out, uh, is this a person who can really play that role, the role of teacher or the role of student for me? At the same time, uh, because the teacher is a wall to be overcome uh, and not a miraculous being to be imitated, the teacher also has to be an ordinary person, a great person, but an ordinary person. Uh, the teacher can't be the Buddha for the student. Um, the teacher has to be a an ordinary person who it is possible for the student to um, overcome. Okay. Stop this again. What then is distinctive about the relationship between uh, teacher and student in Pure Land? So it's certainly not that in Pure Land, the relationship between teacher and student comes to maturity in self-destruction uh, of that relationship. And it's certainly not that in Pure Land, the limit situation is produced through confrontation between the teacher and the student. So we see that very clearly in Shinran's account of Honen. Shinran never describes himself as having overcome Honen. He describes himself to the end of uh, to the end of his days as uh, Honen's disciple, and of course, as many of you know, in general, Pure Land uh, as a tradition does not cultivate a lot of kind of confrontational uh, emotions. So, what is distinctive about the teacher-student relationship in Pure Land, according to Teta, is that the teacher is only a teacher from the point of view of the student. From her own point of view or his own point of view, the teacher is not a teacher. The student looks at someone and says, you are my teacher. But the Pure Land teacher, unlike the Zen teacher, the Pure Land teacher, we would expect, should say, I'm not a teacher. I'm, I'm a practitioner. I'm a practitioner, and if you're a practitioner too, then we can be fellow practitioners. But I don't have any uh, students. I don't have any disciples. So we get that from Shinran's account of Honen, actually, when he tries to describe what Honen's teaching is. Now, Honen's teaching is, just say the Nembutsu and be saved by Amida. There's nothing that Honen knows how to do that Shinran does not know how to do. So Keta says this is really consistent with the Pure Land understanding of itself as a tradition oriented uh, toward other power. She says it's the other power orientation only makes sense if we understand that the, the teacher is the Pure Land teaching and not the person who's doing the, who's, who's telling you about the Pure Land teaching. So a person cannot be the agent that saves you. In the Zen context, the teacher has a really important role to play as the agent, bringing about the conditions for the student's uh, realization. But in other power 
And the other power path of Pure Land, the, the, the teacher is not supposed to be the agent. The teacher uh, is simply a person who is also doing the practice. As a fellow practitioner, uh, Keta says, the teacher conveys the teachings by staking himself on those teachings, by being a person who wagers everything on those teachings. So if we think about Honen's situation, Honen lived during a time of real social or religious transformation. There was a religious world that was very settled and secure, the world of many practices, complex ritual, monastic uh, authority. And he abandoned that world, which was a very secure world, in order to uh, rely completely on nothing but this one practice. Well, Zen has something similar in a way. It's also a single practice school. It's also taking the risk of relying on a single practice. So Honen left the secure world behind him to rely only on Nembutsu, to wager everything on the single practice of Nembutsu uh, and so be saved by Amida. Keta thinks that that's what Shinran saw in Honen, was a person who had come to a limit situation and taken that risk of plunging forward. And she thinks that's what Shinran was um, placing his bet on. Not the teachings exactly, but on Honen's reliance on the teachings. So this is also, she says, creating a limit situation for Shinran, which is expressed in Shinran's uh, assertion that he's relying completely on Honen. And the word I'm translating now as relying, I could also translate, because it is the technical Buddhist term, for taking refuge. When we say taking refuge, in English, I think, refuge sounds like a safe space. I take refuge sounds like, to me, uh, I had always thought of it this way until I, until I read this piece from Keta. I had always thought of it as um, uh, retreating into a safe space. Uh, so I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha, uh, meant to me, because of my English ear, uh, that the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha were creating a kind of safe world. And Keta says, no, <laughs> that's a mistake. Uh, it's a mistake to think of refuge as a retreat into a safe space, into a, a kind of shell. Right? That's what you don't want to do. Uh, on the contrary, taking refuge has meaning when you've become aware of the world as a world of suffering, a Saha world, as someone said earlier. Mm. Uh, and you uh, trust absolutely in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. That's the, the uh, nuance of the Sanskrit for refuge. And the, I think the right nuance for the Japanese of refuge. So you're trusting absolutely in uh, Amida in this case. You're relying upon without any trace of doubt. You're having full and perfect trust. It's the Sanskrit sense of refuge. To really have full and perfect trust in something. And Keta is suggesting that that's, that means you're wagering yourself on it because you can't know what the outcome is. You are relying upon, you are trusting in, you are having this full and perfect trust in, uh, 
at some kind of risk to yourself. You've decided to stake yourself upon something, to try to plunge forward into something. So Shinran's wagering on Honen, Keta thinks, is the articulation of Shinran's own limit situation, where he's saying, I don't know. I, I don't know what will happen if I plunge forward with pure land practice, but I do know what the reality is that I'm coming from, which is this karmic, uh, this karmic condition in which I'm destined to go to hell. So there's hell behind me and I don't quite know what's in front of me, but seeing Honen's total reliance on Amida, I will plunge forward too relying totally on Amida. Keta is telling us that taking refuge, that plunging forward itself is what deepens and expands uh, self-understanding or what deepens and expands understanding of the world. So in contrast to Zen, <clears throat> the teacher here is not a wall to be overcome but a kind of window. She says, the more that Shinran plunges forward, the more his religious understanding deepens and the more transparent Honen becomes to him. The more fully Shinran stakes himself on Honen's teaching, the more transparent Honen becomes to him. Until finally, this ordinary person Honen becomes a window through which Shinran can see the world of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas. That means, she says, when, Honen, uh, when Shinran says that Honen is the Bodhisattva of wisdom, he's describing his vision of Honen, the life-size person in front of him, who has the Bodhisattva behind him or Honen, the life-size person in front of him, who has Amida uh, behind him. So she thinks the meaning of this is not that Shinran, um, not that for Shinran Honen is a bodhisattva in disguise, or not that for Shinran Honen is a, a, an extraordinary miraculous person. She thinks that for Shinran Honen is an ordinary person who is carrying the bodhisattva on his back. And that's why I think she's saying it makes sense that Shinran identifies Honen with Mahasama Prapta, with the bodhisattva of wisdom, because uh, the bodhisattva of wisdom is also a practitioner. So when he's seeing Honen with this practitioner behind him, what he's seeing is the structure of reliance in Pure Land practice. And that means that actually, even as he's seen Honan as a window transparent with the Pure Land behind him, he's still seen Honan as a fellow practitioner. There's some way in which he's still recognizing Honan, Honan's significance to him, Shinran, as a fellow practitioner. Uh, and that's why the teacher, again, in the Pure Land context, in a certain way has to be an ordinary person. If they're not an ordinary person, if they were really, if they were really something, something so special and miraculous, uh, you might get caught up in just them. <clears throat> relying just on them. They'd never become transparent to you, never be able to show you the structure of reliance that allows you to plunge forward. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick... So some of the questions in the chat, they're also, um, they're all phenomenal. Some of them uh, probably make sense as closing questions and some of them may be, uh, oh, there's a... Uh, some of them maybe uh, make more sense uh, to take up just now. I'm wondering if there's a way to take them up in conversation instead of just me. 
hmm, pointing out, oh, Matthew, hi, Matthew, uh, is pointing out that Ketha here in this, as I presented her here, is talking about the one-on-one -on -one physical relationship or kind of like human relationship between teachers and students. And I think that point is really coming out in the way that I have talked about uh, overcoming the teacher. I think you are right. She doesn't, she, she doesn't say this. I feel nervous like she's listening somewhere <laughs> and I, I'm misrepresenting her. So I'll say she doesn't say this, but I think for me that makes perfect sense that I how to say Shran Kuma Sutra in Japanese, so let me look it up for you. And Tori also has a really um, wonderful question about the role of the teacher in the esoteric traditions. I have a thought on it. Um, Keta does not have a thought on it. So again, I think the role of the teacher in Zen. I think she would say that the role of the teacher in Zen uh, only makes sense if the teacher knows and the student comes to know that the teacher uh, has, the, the teacher does not possess religious truth uh, mm -hmm. that can be transmitted to the student. Uh, so she is saying in Zen, religious truth is not transmitted to the student by the teacher. Sure. It is discovered by the student in the overcoming of the teacher. And that's the place where she thinks Zen and Shinshu are the same. So one of the reasons that Ketha is interested in working out how the teacher-student relationship uh, operates in Zen and in Pure Land is that she thinks there is a kind of risk uh, of Buddhist institutions creating conditions for unhealthy human relationships. And she's thinking about the unhealthy human relationship as the relationship in which either uh, the teacher is elevated to the position of a Buddha who has to be relied on permanently, uh, like a kind of cult of personality, she says, or the teacher is instrumentalized uh, and made into nothing other than a tool for the student's awakening. Um, and she thinks actually those, that the deification of the teacher and treating the teacher as a tool, these are just two sides of the same coin. Actually, when you're treating the teacher as a, a kind of deity, you're, you're really tre treating the teacher as a tool. And that is bad for the human being of the teacher and bad for the human being of the student. So she's thinking there is in Zen and Pure Land, um, in the way that they structure student-teacher relationships, although they're quite different, uh, both of them maybe can point us to a healthy human relationship where a hierarchy exists, but the power of the teacher is not um, abused. So this, comes, this question is coming up for me in two ways. First of all, it's coming up for me as a teacher myself. Now, Keta would be the first one to say, hey, hey, you're not teaching, <laughs> you're not teaching religious truth. Uh, you're, you're, you're teaching some facts and knowledge. It's not the same, she says. Uh, but still, uh, in the classroom, the questions of, in the university classroom, questions of hierarchy and power are interesting to me and, and worrisome to me. Uh, some of you may know already that in Confucianism, uh, Confucius describes a world organized through five different kinds of relationships, uh, parent-child, older sibling, younger sibling, husband and wife, ruler and subject, and older friend and younger friend. And I always ask my students when I'm teaching uh, Confucianism in my religious studies classes, um, you know, there's a relationship that's important to him that he doesn't seem to describe. 
which is our relationship, the teacher-student relationship. So of those five relationships, which one is the one that teacher and student should occupy? What are we to each other? And the students always say, ruler and subject. <laughs> you're, you're the emperor and you're crushing us <laughs> beneath you. And uh, it makes me so sad in that. I always say, oh, it makes me so sad. It happens every time. It makes me so sad every time. Actually, we're supposed to be older friend and younger friend. We're supposed to be friends to each other. Uh, but I understand why they say it's emperor and subject, uh, because it must feel to them often as though I have uh, all this power that I can just use indiscriminately and they don't have any, uh, they don't have very much room to complain. When I give them a grade, they don't have very much room to complain. When I tell them to do an assignment, they don't have very much room to say no. There's not a lot of space there. Uh, so I'm interested in <clears throat> ways of uh, adjusting my own teaching to make it more recognizable as friend to friend. And then recently I've been doing some work with a student on uh, Buddhism in the United States and questions of power and abuse of power, especially. So this student has been looking at um, scandals in American Buddhism involving um, teachers who sexually harass their students, who sexually abuse their students, who physically abuse their students. Uh, these different kinds of abuse of power within Buddhist institutions. Um, a lot of Buddhist traditions or uh, uh, Buddhist communities that we looked at in the United States together in trying to come up with solutions to this problem have drawn very heavily on American style solutions, administrative solutions. We, okay, we have a teacher who's abusing students, so we're going to make a board of directors. We're going to try to um, put in structures of oversight. We're going to try to democratize. Uh, these are good solutions. I, th I, just, I think they're good solutions, but they strike me as um, kind of borrowed solutions. And I wonder if there are also resources within Buddhism that could be used to um, talk about or imagine the ways that teachers and students relate to each other that would prevent that kind of abuse or in Keto's terms, that would allow, better allow, the cultivation of very healthy human relationships. So she's saying here that there are resources like that in Zen and in Pure Land uh, that would help us to remember, whether you're a teacher or a student, to help you to remember, although I play the role of teacher, I am an ordinary person. Although I play the role of teacher, I'm a fellow practitioner. Although I play the role of teacher, finally, I have to create a condition in which the student is not um, depending on me. Uh, so I wanted to end by just kind of asking folks if they would to maybe hop on. Some people have already said really insightful things in the comments, but maybe hop on and say, uh, what they think about uh, it is a game, right? That's a, when you wager or place a bet, that's a game, but it's a game with the life and death stakes. So how do you, um, how do you throw yourself into that, into that kind of game? Yeah. Well, you have to do it very, uh, very lightly, I think. Yeah, I think a number of people are talking about the um, idea of uh, mutual respect. And uh, that's a really important idea to Keta as well. Mutuality is a really important idea to Keta as well. Um, and I'm wondering if people would say more about what that means to them, mutual respect. Do you think that that can, is that kind of flexibility also possible in the religious context? Maybe it's even more possible. 
in a Buddhist context. Where, oh. yeah, I think that's absolutely a very, um, that's a profound and interesting thing for me to, to think about how uh, working on the way that you relate to each other in a small community can end up having these very huge effects on the massive community of the state, the massive community of larger society. How we kind of learn from each other how to be friends. Uh, uh, what, what will it look like when that, that way of structuring our relationship extends into all of these other kinds of relationships? Uh, Dean is asking if there is a text that I recommend. Uh, unfortunately, the, te the text that I recommend is Keta's book, which is not yet available in English, but I will take this as um, a, a, good, a good motivation to continue working uh, on, that, on that translation. Uh, if you're interested in Japanese philosophy generally, uh, please consider, uh, there are lots of uh, other works by Kyoto School philosophers that are available now in English. Uh, and uh, all of them are, are very much worth your time.